Snackers, Matt DiNapoli here. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. My name is Kareem Iskander. I'm a lead technical advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. And welcome to episode 98 of Snack Minute. Snack Minute, if you don't know by now, is your <laughs> weekly 10-minute bite of learning covering tech, coding, and some cool projects that we work on. Now, in episode two, I actually looked this up, Kareem. In episode two, we had just released the V1 of the Meraki API, and uh, we went through the interactive documentation and showed people how to get started with those API docs. And now, two years later, <laughs> uh, we have a guest with us. His name's John, and uh, we're going to talk about some updates to the API, updates to the interactive docs, and just some cool stuff that he thinks uh, we want to know. So, John, if you don't mind introducing yourself, and then we'll get started. Sure. It's so great to be here. Um... My name is John Kukta on the product uh, a, uh, product management team for our API and ecosystem. Um, I have been with the team for about three years. One of the first big launches uh, of my tenure was API V1. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so uh, what do you got going for us today? Um, what's new? What can people uh, kind of play around with that they haven't seen before? So when we think about the developer journey, one of the most important parts is the getting started experience, right? And especially um, when we think about our stakeholders, right? We've got, of course, seasoned developers who are using our APIs uh, and we have commercial applications being built on top of our APIs, which we're thrilled to see. But we do not want to forget about the network engineers like me, um, who are network engineers first and then developers second. And so it's super important to us that we have an API that's easy to get started with um, and learn, even if you are not a developer, right? And so there's a lot of things that kind of come out of that. Number one is, is it easy to get the one thing done that you're trying to do, right? And this is a pretty common theme amongst uh, novice developers, um, but seasoned network engineers who know exactly what needs to happen but it's a little fuzzier, how do you get there? So we've made some in, uh, improvements to our interactive API doc site, which we've been proud of for a very long time because it is interactive. And what that means is you can actually run API queries in a demo environment directly from the docs page. So you can get a little sample of what things look like and get a, get a feel for how things work. We've made a few improvements and we are continuously making improvements to this site. There's a few in the pipeline that I'm excited about, but I'm gonna talk today about what we shipped. And that is, for example, a improved search feature. So we have today, uh, I think 600 plus public API endpoints and uh, we're thrilled with the growth, but it's a little difficult to actually navigate 600 different endpoints if you are brand new and you know there's just the one thing you need to get done. So, uh, so let's imagine, right, that you are a, uh, a wireless admin Right, and you know that there has been a, a, a change in your deployment density, uh, so you've added, uh, maybe you've upgraded to Wi-Fi six access points, or or maybe you've um, uh, you, you're adjusting to the uh, new density of return to office, and there are just fewer people in the office, uh, and you're realizing that you can actually reduce your your wireless footprint, and you might want to adjust the power settings of your APs to compensate. And this can be something that's not too hard to do via the GUI, but it's a few clicks. And if you really wanted to be slick and automate this, then you could use the APIs to do so. So we're gonna look at how would you start from this interactive API doc site and then just get straight to the RF profiles management. And in the top left, we have the search field. Uh, so I'm just gonna start typing in RF. And you can see that it's already doing some searching on the uh, on the queries and showing us a few things that are related. And none of these things are really what I want. I'm just going to add a space here. And now I've got the RF profile endpoints. Now I know that I want to update a network R uh, wireless RF profile endpoint. Let me just click that. And it's going to take me directly to the page in the docs that explains the endpoint and the parameters associated with, with it. And on the right-hand side, um, uh, I'll be able to actually uh, dive into the settings and uh, run the uh, run the query against the demo environment. That's very cool. Now um, I'm going to just speak. I'm going to speak out of experience on this. Um, I do know, and people might be wondering. Well, I have all these fields to fill out. You know, why wouldn't I just go into the GUI to do this? 
again, this is the documentation, and this is going to help you actually format the code, format the JSON bodies, and make it so that you can then take what John's going to show us how to do and put that in your code directly. So, um, and I'm excited to see all the updates. I haven't been involved in the updates, but I was involved in the original launches and, and a few things after that. So it's really exciting to see this is still moving forward and how, how cool it is. There's a couple of things to, to point out here too. So we first have the, uh, the explanation of the endpoint. What is the path? What is the operation? What does it do? Um, and some of the parameters associated. One of the major efforts that we've been investing in has been the documentation of all of the schemas in the API. You can imagine that mm -hmm. reverse engineering a public API endpoint to see what it does is not really something you want to dive into, especially if you're not a seasoned developer. Um, unfortunately, a lot of APIs in the world out there today are not really fully documented, and that's something that we take very seriously. So you might have seen in the past an API endpoint where the schema definition was limited to just this object. And that's not super helpful, right? It doesn't really tell you what the API <laughs> endpoint has in its schema and its in its response. And the same same for the for the response. But these schema definitions are, would be really nice to have, and that's something that we've been adding to these API endpoints uh, with quite a bit of coverage today. So if we expand this object, you can see uh, on a per attribute uh, basis what is that attribute, what does it do. And uh, these are all expandable, so you can kind of dive into a little bit more detail around your band settings and uh, five versus 2.4 versus per SSID settings and actually understand what are each of these controls. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, do we have, I think from memory, there was also part of this is an example or a sample code that you actually get to get to test out against the sandbox is that does that still exist here somewhere yes it does so i have zoomed in a little bit let me zoom out because this is a uh, uh actually i can just switch here um let me zoom out a little bit and get this to the uh sample here so there are so many attributes to this to be clear um but there's a <laughs> run button. this is actually a really yes. a really good example um, you know, you yeah. mentioned seasoned developers versus people that are network engineers first and then developers second. But I think even seasoned <laughs> or seasoned developers appreciate this because a lot of the times using an API, just making sure that the, the uh, request body is right is one of the hardest parts after authorization. And so um, us offering the opportunity to build those dynamically and offer examples is just, uh, I'm sure the people that work with this API who don't know this yet are jumping out of their skin going, this is fantastic. Yeah, we have a few different ways to, of learning, right? I mean, one of them is going and reading docs. One of them is not reading the manual and just diving in and trying to get things done and, and hopefully you don't break anything along the way. But it's a very valid, there's lots of valid ways to learn uh, development on APIs and there is no one right or wrong way. Um, a common tactic that I've used that, that I think folks should feel confident um, using st might start with the GUI, right? So you might, for example, mm -hmm. take one RF profile and update it using the GUI to have the settings that you want. You can then use this, uh, this get endpoint to check what that looks like in the API after you've saved the settings, right? And then from there, you know what the response should look like. You have an idea of what all the parameters are and how they translate from the GUI to the API. So if reading docs isn't really your thing, uh, you do have another option available to you, but the docs are there to help make sure that you understand the ramifications of each of these attributes and uh, you know be confident in uh, your changes. I think that's really useful, like especially for folks like myself where I'm super visual, where I actually need to see it in the dashboard and how it's configured to relate it to the API so I can automate it. Um, being able to have that correlation is pretty awesome actually. Um, into the into the documentation itself. So let's sh uh, show us the interactivity, John. Well, let's let's see if we can start by getting some networks, right? So uh, I am going to use the search feature to find the API endpoint that gets me the networks. And I'm going to click get organization networks and uh, get organization ID. Okay, well, I don't have an organization ID either, either. So where would I go? Well, let's go back to the search again and hit get uh, organizations. And that will be the first API endpoint to start with. So let me run that. Okay, it ran it against the actual organization. I've got this information now. I've got an org ID. Let's copy that. 
12155707. Now we can go back to get organization networks and run uh, networks and run that. You as a network admin, right? have some environment, right? Now, first of all, you don't even have to have a paid Meraki license or anything to go and create a new dashboard organization and do that via the GUI. You can just sign up with your own personal email and create an environment. That's actually easy to do via our just uh, sign up sheet, right? There's no APIs required there. Now, if you have your own environment, then this interactivity is actually a lot more exciting, I think, because now you've got full read write access to the to the uh, environment. So if we go back to that get organizations, let's actually start here, right? So this get organizations um, uh, call, the uh, API key that's used for this query is customizable, right? So we go to and hit this configuration button and you're gonna see an API key. This is a read only API key in the demo environment for the purposes of having something that gets you some sample data, right? So it's a little bit more useful for those gets, right? Now. If you go and generate your own API key, right, for your own environment, you're gonna have read write access to that environment. You just paste in your own API key here, and then the subsequent calls are gonna be made using that API key. They're gonna give you the real API output from your environment. So if I change this API key and then put in, uh, and then hit run again, the list of organizations that are gonna be returned are gonna be based on the API key, right? So I'm gonna have the organizations that I have access to. And that might be my production organizations if I'm using the same username, and then the demo organizations or the uh, the testing organizations that I've created for the purposes of really learning the APIs. And then from there, uh, creating networks, et cetera, you could even do all of that part via, a, uh, via the GUI if you wanna get started. Um, and using that same API key, now that you've set it, the subsequent pages will use that API key for the other, uh, other commands. And you'll be able to uh, interact with your own environment and not be subject to the limitations of the demo environment. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome, John. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, everyone, you know, go go check out the updates to the uh, Meraki developer documentation. It is one of the best ones we have, I have to say. Um, and one thing and I want to add, actually, if you're if you're looking to get started with automation, automating your network with Meraki or Meraki in general, and 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 some of the things that that John talked about. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I think a couple of learning path on Cisco U for you to check out. So um, head over to Cisco U. We'll we'll take you all through that training journey there and come back and test out everything that you learned here uh, with uh, with me and John and and Maddie. So yeah, thanks, John. But before we let you go, uh, this is your first time as a guest, so we do have to ask the question: uh, What superpower would you have and why? Oh, this is tough. This is really tough. Um, I. I would probably say X-ray vision if I had a superpower, um, because uh, I feel like I can see through a lot of the a lot of the madness, a lot of the noise. So yeah, I would go with X-ray vision. As long as uh, you can turn it on and turn it off, because some things you don't want to see through. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes you just please no. <laughs> but that's the life of a network admin, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, I think that's the first time we've had X-ray vision, so um, we'll we'll take that one. <laughs> John, awesome. thanks for your time, Snackers. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, join us next week uh, for episode ninety-nine, or we're counting up to a hundred, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>